Alex McDonald, welcome to Built to Sell Radio. Hey, John. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Tell me the founding story of Velocity Black. How did this business get started? Good question. So, I mean, this is uh, this is nine years ago now, so early 2014. Um, certainly a, a very different uh, era in terms of startups and, and venture. And particularly, and given we started it in the UK and London, uh, a very, very different scene over here back then. It was very hard to raise money. Um, it was, uh, yeah, you basically had to have banks and stuff helping you. But um, the genesis behind it was... Um, me and my co-founder Zia were traveling a lot in our previous careers, always in new towns, new cities, um, trying to find awesome stuff to do, trying to get access to it. And actually, when we started the company, it was called Velocity. And our first product was not Velocity Black. Our first product was a an app which enabled you to view the bill on your phone and pay on your phone in top restaurants. So in, you know, the car bones of this world, um, you'd be able to view the bill live on your phone, split it with friends and pay and get up and leave, which is like an idea which, you know, captures a lot of people's imaginations because no one likes waiting for the bill, right? Um, and so it was very popular initially. We also enabled people to discover restaurants, book them through the product. Um, it grew very quickly, but the actual unit economics around that product were, were awful. Um, it costs a lot of money to acquire customers. And we didn't, we made very slim sort of margins on, on payment volumes, uh, with that product. And, you know, after a few years, despite investors wanting to give us even more money to continue pursuing that product, we, you know, me and Zia sat down and we said to ourselves, look, you know, we want, you know, we always wanted to build a real business, right? We weren't just playing the startup game uh, as a, as a hobby. We wanted to build a real business, which had real impact. And, you know, we realized, okay, what do we have, which is valuable? Like what, what assets do we have as a business which are valuable? And whilst the restaurants themselves, you know, are not necessarily good businesses or very interesting businesses to work with, the clients that had been using our product to go to those very high end, you know, premium restaurants were actually very interesting. And, and when we looked at the other areas of their life that they were spending money on, particularly travel. Um, you know, experiences, going to sporting events, going to music events, um, buying luxury goods and various other um, luxury purchases. We realized the economics around those those other areas for that client were interesting. And if we could build a more holistic product, which would um, digitize, I guess, what, what was a very old industry in terms of concierge, um, we thought that that would be very interesting. And um, so we completely pivoted after our Series B, pretty much the day after our Series B. And um, we just raised uh, more than $20 million. And despite having all that money in the company's bank account, we were, we were never more stressed than we were post the closing of that round. How did, um, how did that work? Because did you, were you pitching investors on this new idea? It sounds like mm -hmm. you got the money and then changed the business model. That, that was, what? Yeah, look, it was, um, there was a part of our deck, we talked about this and we, we called it Velocity Premium at the time, terrible name. And we had tested it and we knew that people were willing to pay, for example, to get the very best restaurant reservations, right? Um, so and so we tested some of it. So it was part of that Series B pitch, but it was by no means the core of, of the pitch. So yeah, look, it was a it was a complete change in in course. Um, you know, we did continue with the old product for a few months whilst we launched Velocity Black and and proved that it could be, you know, that could generate the kind of revenue and growth that we we you know we thought it could. Okay, so I'm um, but yeah, I, I'm a I'm an Amex loyalist. I've had an Amex card for God knows mm -hmm. how long. And and they pitched me. I, I think they have this concierge. What, what do they call it? Uh, front of the line. They have Centurion. They have Centurion, and then they have Platinum. Yeah, I don't think I'm fancy enough to get the Centurion. I've got the Platinum, I think, or maybe yeah. yeah. So I think in theory, I, I get a call from my Amex rep like once a month, and and and, and I feel so. I've never returned the call, but they they also. I think they want to get me using the the extra stuff that the card has mm -hmm. in order to make me more loyal. I haven't yet, but I know people that use front of the line. They buy, they, I think they get like concert tickets and stuff. It just hasn't been my headspace. So as I trying to get a sense of what Velocity Black was, it was something similar to, to what I have access to through Amex, which is I could call and get mm -hmm. premium access to 
fancy restaurants or concerts that are sold out. Am I getting it kind of right or totally off base? Absolutely, yeah. But instead of having, instead of doing that with with uh, with a phone and with lots of humans, we invested a lot in technology, and particularly using artificial intelligence and gen- genuinely using AI. You know, before it was cool um, to to basically automate a lot of that um, that experience. And you know, and it was all delivered through an app. You know, we were the first company to launch a product where people paid several thousand dollars a year to be a member um, as as a concierge customer. And we didn't give them a phone number, right? Which at the time was like quite controversial. It's like, what? So I'm paying several thousand dollars and you won't even give me a phone number to call? And we're like, no, we built this app and we think it is a much better customer experience. And it was, and it still is. Wow. So um, people actually, so the business model was not necessarily licensing it to the credit card companies. It was getting them to pay up front, pay actually, yeah. take money out of their pocket and pay for this app. How, how on earth did you do that? Because I'm looking at like, the competitive set, because again, even just Amex on its own says, oh, we'll give you front of the line. It's free. You don't even have to buy it. Just get a platinum card, mm-hmm. uh, which it costs you three or $400 a year. So how on earth did you compete with free? We had a, in my opinion, 50 times better product. And, it, and if you build a product which is genuinely, you know, at least 10 times better than, than what is out there currently, um, and you know your customer really well. We knew our customer really well. Um, you know, me and Zia were in some ways this customer, but we we had lots of friends, we had lots of investors, and we had lots of existing Velocity customers who we knew very well. Um, we knew what they were doing and how, and their frustrations with with using a phone based sort of concierge system to the point where they didn't really use it that much, right? Even what Amex would consider to be a very heavy user, it was you know it was. 10 times less engagement than we would see from a Velocity Black user. Because if you make things super easy and simple, right, if you remove the fact that you have to speak to someone on the phone and then whatever, you don't get through to the right person, Amex is, or whichever the concierge company you're dealing with is routing you to someone else to help with it. And then they phone you back or you're in a meeting. It's just an incredibly friction, you know, there's a lot of friction in that experience. And if you can do everything through, through an app where it involves messaging, but also instantly booking stuff and you know, uh, you deliver that in a way which is right for a premium customer, which is tough, very tough because, you know, these are the most successful people in the world that are your clients and they have very high expectations. But if you can do that, um, you can charge you can charge a lot of money for it, right? Because you're saving those people huge amounts of time. Not only are you saving them time, but you're helping them get the most out of every minute of their life, right? It's like, you know, when when if you look at the limitations on high net worths, um, I guess, ability uh, to, to enjoy things. Capital isn't really the thing that's holding them back. It's their time, right? They don't have enough minutes or hours in the year to do all the things that they want to do. And, you know, um, uh, that, that in- includes, you know, the various things they want to do from a career perspective. But we created a product which helped them live their best life. And that is incredibly alluring. Um, and, uh, and once you have the product in your hands, right, we, we did some events and things at the beginning to help build our brand and, you know, obviously seeded the product with people who we felt were the target customer and, and influential. And, you know, once people really experienced that, it was very easy for us to price it. And actually, you know, I believe we could have charged a lot more money than, than we charged okay, on so an annual basis. I'm for the product. struggling with what the product is because I'm like, I'm visualizing. Okay, so... Maybe. So it's an app where 24-7-365, you can message in and you will, um, whether it's dining, travel experiences, luxury goods, you want to book a last minute table at Carbon, you want to, um, you know, you want to book a, a flight, a business class flight from London to New York at a much better price than you find online. You message in, you'll get a one guaranteed one minute response time from a specialist in whatever you're requesting. You know, the technology, a lot of it is around natural language understanding. So it interprets your request, mm-hmm. it routes it to the right person. In some cases, it will automate some of the request flow or hit various APIs and do various things to make it um, basically give the the agent who's handling your request superpowers, is the way I'd put it, and uh, and deliver what you want in a, in a personalized way. And because we know a lot about you, we know, you know when someone's onboarded, we gather lots of information about them and their lifestyle. Um, we're able to do things in a way which is hyper personalized, but at scale, right? Um, which is really challenging to do. You, wanna, you know, hyper personalized normally means I need to know you really well, John, to give you 
what you want. But if we can make the system know every client really well, then any person you're dealing with, even if you haven't, you know, spoken with this agent before through through the app, will be able to deliver you a hyper personalized service. Got it. Okay, so that's that's super helpful, and I'm just trying to get my head around the supply of the unique experiences. So, mm-hmm. if I'm David Beckham, um, I've got a fleet of assistants who can get me into Carbone anytime I want. It. Because I'm David Beckham and I just make, like, I get one of the three people that are following me around in my limousine to, to like, just do it. And I don't need to know how it happens. So I'm assuming, and then if I'm, if I'm like John Orlow, shitty little John Orlow, he just calls Amex and waits on, on the phone and tries to get in and they tell him, oh, well, let me transfer your call. So there, you're, you're in the middle between David Beckham and John Orlow, right? You're, you're, you're an elite customer who maybe doesn't have a fleet of assistants, but has the desire to have these very premium experiences, right? It, yeah. It's somewhere um, between those two people. Am I getting that right? Well, we, we served all of the groups that you just talked about. Um, to give you one example, he, he, was, a, he was actually a shareholder of Velocity, and um, he's a, a very uh, big sort of hotel founder and investor. Mm. Um, Multi multi billionaire. He does have eleven assistants. They did have access to the product, right? We had assistant accounts and stuff, but he would still use the product himself directly. Really? And there are certain things, of course, yeah. There are certain things. Firstly, you know, I, let's say you've got an assistant, and where she's based in Miami. Okay, cool. You're traveling to Switzerland, and you want, you know, you want a reservation at the Gustav Palace, and you want, you know, you want uh, various restaurant reservations. Does she know which of the best restaurants to go to? Right? No. Well, we have a global team of experts in all these different places who are able to not only uh, help you get access to the reservation, but know which place you should go to, right? And that's the level, you know, there's a difference between an assistant and an advisor. I used to talk to the team a lot about this, right? An assistant is really someone you tr- trust to execute something for you. An advisor is someone you listen to about what you should do. And our, our sort of aspiration was always to take what our service from not just being an execution sort of assistant um, level product to actually being an advisory product. Because, you know, if, if, if our clients trust us enough to let us tell them where they should go, um, firstly, that makes the execution part much easier for us, right? Um, and secondly, it's just a much higher value relationship. You'd pay an advisor a lot more than you pay an assistant. And so, so where does it um, get- But we had, we, had, we had clients with 11 assistants using the product directly themselves. And for some, sometimes it was for expertise reasons why they'd use it. Sometimes it's because this, something was so important to them as you might know, John, every time you have an intermediary between you and the person who's ultimately delivering you a service, there is a, you know, there's an element of Chinese whispers and breakdown in communication, right? And so for, you know, for stuff which is super important to someone, very personal, they want to be directly speaking to the person who's helping them do it. Yeah. And, um, and so they, they'd use the product. But yeah, we, we had everyone from those sort of top tier celebrities and athletes using the product through to... Um, through to a lot of platinum card members who were um, frustrated, maybe looking for a, for a more for a more modern experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I get it now. I love this advisor concept, and that, and thank you for distinguishing it between an assistant because I think that's really cool. When you think about an advisor, uh, they're obviously informed. W- was that uh, done at scale? Meaning you had an algorithm that was picking the five star rating and you're picking the buzz about a certain restaurant in, mm-hmm. in Geneva or whatever. It, was that at scale or was that like a human being that was scouting out the cool restaurants in Geneva or the cool but concerts? It's but a bit of both. Okay. A bit of both. But you'd be surprised at how similar the lifestyle, uh, tastes, um, habits of a high net worth individual in London is to a high net worth individual in Hong Kong or in New York or in, you know, Spain um, or sitting in Madrid. Um, uh, It's a very homogenous um, set of tastes and interests. I'm not saying it's completely homogenous. You still need to personalize things. But, you know, we used to joke or I used to joke and say, right, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's Japanese Blossom Month, right? We knew all of our... US clients will be going to Japan for that month. And, you know, like there is, uh, there is a, a lot of trends around the places that they go to and the things they want to do. And so we had people in the team who had 
you know, who are a part of that lifestyle and community and, and knew about the new openings before anyone else did and knew about the latest trendy destinations before anyone else did. So there's an editorial curatory aspect of the team. Mm -hmm. And then you layer on technology to uh, augment that with a lot more information and, and you're able to deliver something which, again, to this day, no one else has delivered. So, so cool. But it is an element of both. Yeah, yeah, so cool. Talk to me about the financing journey you guys went on because uh, it sounds like Series B was the twenty million dollar raise and like the uh, mm -hmm. the pivot to to this new model. But there was a uh, a seed round, I think, and, and maybe even a Series Series A before that. So maybe mm -hmm. just walk through what was the first round you raised and and how did that uh, change your your thinking about the business. Sure. So me and, me and Zia were lucky enough to have done one in our previous careers where we had a little bit of capital we could invest, you know, um, uh, just over $100,000 each um, in the business when we first started. And that helped us at least build our MVP. We built an MVP with that of, of our first product. Um, once we had the MVP, um, we went to basically friends, family and uh, and sort of extended a uh, group of advisors Um I did a small seed round. Um, I think it was just it was just over a million dollars, if I'm not wrong. Um, we used that to sort of expand the product into a, a lot more, uh, well, increased distribution, let me put it that way. And then quite soon after that, we did a Series A, which was, I think, about $8 million, um was the total raise for that Series A. How did... And then... How did, just let me mm -hmm. ask you, Alex, before we go further, how did, how did raising the seed round impact your your approach to the business like here let me while you think about it let me just tell you what i've heard and maybe you can validate or, or refute sure. uh, you know it's all well and good when founders kick in cash i get it but when you actually go raise external money there's this all of a sudden there's this clock that starts ticking because external people friends family advisors want to mm -hmm. return and so there's this obviously implicit uh goal to build to sell that we are going to have an exit at mm. some point and we need to help you monetize this investment that you've made with us and i'd just be curious did, did that happen with you did you did a flip get switched to think man we got to get a return for these guys or, or or not we always wanted to build a big a big business i i, I wasn't personally thinking about exits at that, at that point in time there was no exit strategy of course if an investor asked we would have a good answer but uh, there was really no exit strategy me and Zia just really wanted to build a big impactful business and um, we you know we never planned on selling any of our own shares we never planned actually on selling the business and I'm sure we'll get onto that but um you know that was never part of the plan like it was you know it, it became uh, you know a few years later it became obvious to us right that we would at some point, I have to actually at least get some money back for these shareholders because you know after several years, people do start asking questions. Right? When are we? <laughs> how are we gonna? How are we gonna generate some some returns or liquidity for ourselves? So, um, but that was no, you know. And I tend to find, you know, I do a lot of um, angel investing in early stage companies, and I tend to find the best founders don't don't talk about exit plans or strategies at the start. Um, there and, and it depends what they're building, right? There are some companies, and look, there are many great bootstrap founders I know who who um, build stuff to sell, right? And uh, I love that, and it, it's an awesome way for them to you know create uh, create wealth for for, for their families, etc. Um, but I was never it was never really part of our plan. We didn't say, hey, we're going to sell this in five years, and here who we're going to sell it to. Um, we were just, we always thought it could be very big and we, uh, you know, we were focused on, on make it very big and having maximum Im impact. And I think if you do that, you know, you get the, the exit opportunities will come to you, right? Um, if, if you are, if you are building a really valuable business and it's growing rapidly and it, and it becomes big, the, the, the exit opportunities do present themselves to you. Yeah. What was it about having a big company that you found alluring? Um, I just, I, I like building things which have an impact, right? It's like how many, you know, how many, uh, how many people's lives can you touch with something that you're, you're creating, right? And whether that's your team, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I, st I used to question when people would say, oh, what do you do? And they'd say, oh, I run a company and it has this many people. And I always used to question, like, why do people say that? 
Why did they not talk about the revenue or something or the market cap or whatever? But I, I've come to realize that it's actually, it's an interesting perspective because those are how many people's sort of lives and families are actually dependent on, on something you're building. And there's actually something very gratifying and um, and positive about that, right? The number of people in your team, you're like, these are people you're joining on your journey and, and you're in many ways supporting them and their families, right? Um, but so there's the team aspect. There's obviously the customer's aspect. How can you create something valuable? You know, it's there's nothing better than seeing someone you know use your product and love using your product right it's just like there's no better feeling um as an entrepreneur than that to be honest at least for me um and so so yeah the bigger that that impact can be the better i'd feel in terms of customers in terms of team um and you know the kind of the the, the monetary side of it is like it's a it's obviously an outcome it's, it's it's a scoring card i guess of of how how well you've done of your progress but um it's it was never like hey we need to build and sell this for you know a billion dollars after five years that we, we didn't think about things that way that's helpful how did how did the the series a round compare with the friends and family round of the seed round i i'm i'm particularly interested in and in what questions you got from a round investors and how those were different than kind of amateur investors that you typically have in a in a seed round. Yeah, um, it was a lot more thorough and detailed process in, what way? in some ways. You know, I think our, our friends and family slash seed round was you know a few decks and a few phone calls and a, like maybe a couple of meetings, and it was done. I mean, it, it was not um, it was nowhere near as, as rigorous as the Series A where we put together a very detailed data room with with you know dozens if not hundreds of documents we did basically what what back then you'd call it a roadshow um you know we wouldn't be doing these things on, on zoom or calls you'd go and meet a lot of investors yeah. and we went to meet <sighs> at least 50 if not 100 investors for that series a and yeah. the questions are very detailed um you know uh, the, the pitch you know there's i think there's really two parts to doing a fundraising round like that there's the pitch you have to grab the imagination of the, of the people that you're speaking to and for them to understand that you're, you know, an intelligent, resilient founder who's got sales ability and can grow this to be very large. Then there's the kind of rigorous follow up from that, which is like all the detail, like when they're asking detailed questions, how, you know, how thorough uh, are your answers? Do you really demonstrate that you know your market, that you know your customers? And uh, do you demonstrate that you've got what, it's, what it takes to be, you know, founder of a, a fast growing company? Um, and you know, that, that, that second part takes up a lot of time, right? It's, uh, first part takes up a lot of energy because you have to be on top of your game when you're pitching an investor. Um, but the, the second part takes up a lot of time. You have to, you know, carefully draft and think about responses to, to emailed questions. You have to create sometimes entirely new documents and policies based on questions. You know, can you show us your cybersecurity policy? Okay. We better go and create that. <laughs> Um, so, so, uh, so it's a lot more, it's a lot more rigorous. Um, and, uh, yeah. And again, it's a, it's a journey, um, for someone to lead your round and have in, in many ways the reputational risk of leading your round, right? Cause most of the other investors who come in, they don't have a reputational risk really around investing in the round, whereas the lead really does because they're meant to have done. The real homework on you. They're meant to have, you know, rigorously done some DD and and obviously negotiated the terms, which which everyone else follows. So, um, you know, you have to build good trust um, with with whoever that lead is, and 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 that that takes time, right? I I don't think, you know, certainly nowadays, this may be the case. Like this may not be the case a year and a half ago, but right now, I don't think there are rounds getting done where you're sort of talking to an investor for the first time and they're they're writing a check a few weeks later, right? It's yeah. It takes time to build trust and 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 uh, and your reputation with uh, with the lead investor. What were the deal terms on that B round in terms of liquidity preferences? I mean, I'm trying to place this in terms of, you know, now of course there's not entrepreneurs are are sort of going hat in hand to investors and they don't have a lot of leverage. Three or four years ago, they had all sorts of leverage and they were able to wipe out a lot of liquidity preferences. But I think at this stage. They were still deals that are getting done at like two and three x liquidity preferences. What are you able to share? What the, the B round guys got in the way of liquidity preferences? 
We did have a liquidity preference, but we didn't have a, a two or a three X um, liquidity preference. So, so they were able to they, get their they, money out on a, on an on an exit, effectively, uh, as correct. Sort of the first yeah. before in the, preference the, the yeah. founder shares. Yeah. The, the main reason that um, investors put a one X liquidity preference in is uh, it's actually because there's a, a risk that immediately after the round, the founders wind up the company. And distribute the money to all the shareholders, <laughs> right? And if you don't have that liquidity preference, you're gonna you're not gonna get your money back, right? It's gonna be distributed to everyone else, um, and you'll get a small portion back. So that's the real reason investors do it. Um, obviously, if you're talking about a two x or three x uh, liquidation preference, that's a different story, and that, that's um, you know can be dangerous um, for, for founders. And if you're a founder considering that, I advise you to think very carefully before accepting terms like that <laughs> because it, it takes a big bar. In terms of where you need to get to with the money you're raising, for you to get really ahead of that, yeah, we've that liquidation preference. Yeah, we've interviewed a lot of people that, that had you know two and three x liquidity preference deals, and and yeah, they got washed out or you know virtually washed out. So it's a, it's a, it's a struggle. So you moved to the the new model, concierge digital concierge advisor model. I get that. That's after the Series B, and then what happens? What are the, as you think about the journey? What, what's the next inflection point that that you uh, that you had? Well, there was quite a lot going on when we uh, when we did that pivot. Um, as you intimated to you earlier, there are many vessels that we just raised from uh, where we had effectively completely changed the plan very shortly after. Yeah, how did you get them after on that round? Yeah. Well, yeah, look, we, we did, you know, we did end up going out and asking shareholders to approve that and they did approve it. Um, but by that point, it had helped that we, you know, Velocity Black revenue grew very, very rapidly. Um, you know, it, it was, you know, reaching millions of dollars in certainly in cash flow, at how you define revenue within a few months. So it, it was... Um, it was very rapid uh, growth and results, and that obviously helped us, you know, justify the decision in many ways we'd already taken um, to, to pivot the business towards that product. But it was not like it was a. Don't get me wrong. There's, it was a. It was a, a brave and you know, uh, it was a brave decision we had to make there, and it could have gone the other way, right? And we could have had a lot of very unhappy investors who said, you know, you had a very different plan. What's what's going on? And so, as I understand the business model, the end user would pay several thousand dollars a year for access mm -hmm. to Velocity Black, um, and then and then this we had we had transactional yeah per year, so they pay a few thousand dollars per year upfront as a membership fee, and then we'd have a uh, transactional revenue as well. So every time they book travel or ex an experience or luxury goods, we would take a percentage on the supply side <coughs> as a revenue share. Um, and we'd always deliver the best price to the customer, right? For for, the, for that experience, they'd be getting a better price than they'd see anywhere else. But we would also get a revenue share from the supplier, whether it be a hotel, private aviation operator, um, airline, yacht charter. What was the ca um, what was the cash flow on the transaction piece? So the private aviation charter, they, they would they kick it back to you like 60, 90 days later, or did you get it up front? Or no, we we would we would get it up front. Right, up we front. controlled all of the cash flow um, around the customer experiences, so we would effectively and most uh, on most of that transactional revenue, we would be collecting up front. So you had a payment processing engine in the actual yeah. app, and then you distributed it out to the the vendor. Correct, got it. Mm -hmm. That makes tons of sense. So you're getting a piece of. The transaction, but also you got a membership fee, which they pay annually, or is it a one time? Annually, annually, annually. Fantastic. So, 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 yeah. Look, so the interesting thing is, post the Series B, we, we did raise some more money, but nowhere near as much as we'd raised pre the Series B, and the, and despite us investing a lot more post the Series B, and the reason for that is because we're able to. Um, the membership fee obviously comes up front. So from a capital, uh, you know, it's very capital efficient business. Mm -hmm. We get the working capital, we get the cash up front for the membership and that we can invest that immediately in, in growing and, and signing up more members. And we also obviously had a very um, good working capital sort of dynamic with the experiences and travel that we we're booking through the product as well. How did you acquire subscribers? Like what did you find to be the yeah. most efficient vehicle for doing that? Uh, so, so initially, we, we you know we had to build a premium brand, right? We had we were going after um, premium customers. It was quite hard to do that in a short space of time. But one of the the tactics we used were events. So we held events at a lot of the, I guess, uh, 
the existing events on the social calendar of the high net worth clients we were going after. So we did we did an Oscars after party. We did an event at Coachella. Um, we did various events around sporting events around the world and the destinations that, that these clients were traveling to at certain times a year. And that helped with, you know, with top talent performing at those events and, you know, um, I guess a, a community element to them. So it was more than just a digital product and you kind of had to be a member to get into those events. Oh, cool. Right. Um, and then we, a lot of the rest really came from referrals. We had a couple of people in the team who had very good networks in this space and were, you know, you'd call them membership salespeople, but, um, you know, we didn't call them that internally. They were membership directors and uh, they would sign up some initial people. And then pretty much all of the rest was referral driven. So we had very strong referral dynamics. Um, we had people who would, you know, share the app with their friends. We had some incentives for doing that, but I don't think people were doing it for the financial incentives. I think they were doing it for the social incentives of having shown their friends something really cool. Oh, okay. um, and then we did a little bit of, in the later years, we did do some Google um, Google ads, funnily enough, um, not necessarily around concierge, but around some of the things like that we were helping people with, like private aviation, which um, which really helped sort of target the right kind of customers and um and that was you know that was a good sort of addition to the to the marketing that we were doing but um yeah initially it was many events and then it, as as we obviously grew the membership base referrals became more and more important and what was the referral uh, bonus structure sometimes i've seen them with you know like tesla does the referral where the the, the person that that is being referred is get some sort of benefit it's like a x number of hours yeah. of free charging or whatever but then on the other side that the person making the referral also gets the same. So there's, there's kind of incentive for both the, the person making the referral as, as well as mm-hmm. one being referred. How did you structure that? Yeah, it's funny. We actually looked at Tesla's referral program when we were building our own. That's, it's funny you mentioned them. And and so there are some aspects of theirs, which is you know, they have some random gifts and stuff they have as part of their referral program, like go and, you know, go and watch a SpaceX launch or a tour of the SpaceX facility, things like that, which we thought were awesome. Um, but at first, we just started off with yeah, a two-sided financial referral. It was five hundred dollars each way, so five hundred dollars for the person who received it. If they, you know, it would basically worked as a trial, right? Because we wanted people to use the product. So you try it out for two weeks. If they converted to a membership, they would get some credit to spend on experiences or travel through the product. And the person who referred would also get some uh, some five hundred dollars to to spend on whatever they want to the product. So it was it was a credit that sat on their account basically. The most efficient form of growth, word of mouth. It's amazing. How big did you get this company uh, before you sold it? In terms, of, like, I'm not sure if you released revenue numbers somewhere. I had 18 million. I have no idea if that's true or not. That was that was mm-hmm. my producer said was the, the revenue number. Um, is that a, is that it's about accurate or is it totally off? It's a little bit old that one. <laughs> we were at that point a few years ago. Um, I had to think about what's public knowledge, but you know, we have GMV, right, which is like all the transactions going through the platform. Which, when uh, when we sold, was certainly around nine figures, so around one hundred million dollars. And then we have our net revenue, which uh, was around thirty million dollars at the point of the time of sale. Got it. Um, and uh, and then yeah, we obviously had we we had relatively you know sixty sixty seventy percent. Uh, gross margins and um, we were loss making throughout the journey from a PL perspective but we've been generating positive cash flow for several years um, because of that working capital dynamic we you know EBITDA trails your your cash flow basically you, you turn cash flow positive before you turn EBITDA uh, positive but there are a few quarters where in fact there were several quarters where we EBITDA positive um, towards the end um, I say the end uh, towards the uh, Prior to the sale, um, and uh, and yeah, we were never net uh, net profitable though. Um, we were still always sort of reinvesting every all that cash flow in, into growth. Yeah, um, we were still growing. We were still growing at like between sixty in the last few years, sixty to one hundred percent year on year revenue growth. So it was still growing very rapidly. Wow. What made you decide to sell? What was the trigger? So, um, so there's, there's a few things. So I, I had um, two months before we got the offer, I had stepped back to be non-exec chairman to start another company, SQL. Um, and I was still, you know, I was still, uh, I was still dedicating quite a lot of time to Velocity, to be honest, um, particularly in those months. 
Um, but that I think that certainly had an impact on, on the decision. Um, and the other aspect was, you know, we had, so we had the Velocity Black, which was our consumer product. And then as you intimated earlier, we, we actually had a, an enterprise product where we white labeled the technology for credit card companies, banks, um, other corporate clients. Um, you know, we look after all Rolls Royce clients globally. We look after a number of other um, sort of premium brands that, that want a, a way to build a stronger relationship with their, with their high net worth clients. So that enterprise division was doing really well. And, you know, we had thought for a number of years because we knew how unique what we built was, not just on the client side, but all of the internal technology we had around managing requests, payments, you know, the natural language processing, all this stuff we've been doing. Um, we knew it was completely unique. And we felt it was a matter of time before a bank or a credit card company um, would make an offer. Um, we never started a process to do that. And, you know, with Capital One, it started out as a, a partnership discussion. And so we signed a partnership agreement with them to help them launch a new product. And that then turned into a, would you, you know, would you like us to invest in you? And we were like, no, we don't need any money because uh, we didn't. And, uh, and then eventually it came to a, well, would you consider, you know, us acquiring you? Um, and, you know, I did, like we weren't planning on selling the business at that point. And like, you know, I, I, whilst I was at that point part time in the business and Zia was continuing full time, I fully backed Zia to continue growing it and, and take it to, uh, you know, the, the heights that we thought it could get to. But, um, but look, when, when you have a, you know, a, a $50 billion market cap bank say that they're interested in buying you, I think you have to, I think you have to listen. Yeah. Um, you have an obligate, particularly, you know, we were eight years at the time of the offer, we were eight years into the journey and we had some shareholders who had asked us, you know, what, what's the plan on, you know, are you guys going to list, are you going to sell? So we, we knew there were some shareholders who we wanted to sell. And I think you have an obligation to at least listen uh, to what the offer might be. Um, which we did, um, and they, they made an offer, um, which was a good initial offer, and uh, beyond, uh, I think probably beyond our expectations at that point, to be honest. Um, but uh, but we felt like obviously you have to maximize value for the shareholders, so received the offer. We immediately appointed a bank to run a process, started that process, and then we received a second offer, um, which was a better offer. Uh, which uh, which we accepted, and once we once we accepted that, we were in exclusivity. This, the second um, offer was from Capital One as well. Correct. So, yeah. so let me get this straight. They say, "Hey, um, let's partner. We got a new card we want to launch." You say, "Sure." They say, "Hey, can we have exclusivity?" You say, "No." <laughs> Did the, mm -hmm. the specter of exclusivity come up uh, from them, or they wanted to Shh, look ahead? with every offer they would. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to comment on how they go about M and A, but I think for a bank like that, if they're going to if they're going to buy someone, you know, and they're putting an offer on the table, I think they're going to want they're going to need you to be an exclusive. No, right? sorry, you um, misunderstood my question. I, I'm assuming in the part um, these partnership conversations, the ones I've been involved in with oh, yeah. very large enterprise companies, they usually start off in an innocuous fashion. They're like, oh, like we, you know, we want to work with you. And then mm -hmm. they realize you've got something really that they don't want their competitors to have. So they ask for exclusivity. That obviously sure. puts a cap on how fast you can grow. So you're like, no, I don't want exclusivity. Right. And, yeah. and and then they're like, well, can we invest? And you're like, I don't want money. And then it goes. So did, was, did, did it follow that sort of trajectory where they wanted exclusivity on the product? You're like, no, because we have all these other enterprise clients. Yeah, I think that uh, pretty much every enterprise client that we had asked for exclusivity. Um, and I don't, we may have given it for like a couple of months to someone to give them like a, an advantage in a certain market, but we, we never agreed to sort of a category exclusivity. Um, and yeah, like that's pretty much how the conversation goes um, without giving away any details. Yeah. Um, you know, the other aspect around us not agreeing to an, an investment offer, um, you know, and they've invested successfully. They're probably one of the most successful corporate venture investors out there, Capital One. They made some amazing investments if you go and look them up, including Snowflake and a number of others. Um, 
you know, for us, we felt, particularly given how strategic they were to what we were doing, besides us not needing the money, we felt that accepting an investment would basically preclude a whole number of potential exit paths in the future. You know, there's lots of their competitors that were interested in buying us and had been for a long time, um, who who obviously would have completely disengaged after an investment uh, from, from them, right? So we felt like strategically it would be shooting ourselves in the foot to take investment from, from someone so strategically close to what we're doing with lots of potential competing uh, exit routes. Um, so we decided, you know, that that wasn't for us. And, um, but yeah, it's pretty much that, that sort of progression as you discussed, you know, it's partnership and then it's like, wow, this is amazing. How can we lock it down for ourselves? <laughs> and, uh, and it, it sort of ends up in, in, yeah, in the successful sale of the company. You, you mentioned something in passing and I, I want to go back to it because it, it, it is a pretty big deal. And that is that you had made the decision to step down two months previously. Maybe, mm-hmm. can you walk us through what, what went into that decision? Sure. Um, I had, you know, I was pro- I probably thought about it a little earlier than that, actually. I've, I've been thinking about it just before COVID and then COVID hit and I was like, right, there's no way I'm, I'm you know, adding complication to this terrible situation. I'm going to, we're going to get the company through this and it's going to come out even stronger, which it was, you know, at the point where I said I, I wanted to step back to non-exec chairman. I wouldn't say I was leaving, you know, um, but I, when I wanted to step back from at least the executive responsibilities I had, um, the company was in the strongest position it had been in its history um, in pretty much every metric. So uh, I felt like the company was in a very good place. We had a lot of, at that point in time, there was uh, there was still a lot of innovation happening from a product perspective, but from an operations perspective, which was everything I was involved, you know, responsible for, um, you know, most of the revenue of the company and, and most of the headcount, there was less, like it was a very stable ship by that point. How many employees? You know, there been a lot. Uh, just just over a hundred. Okay. Um, so uh, still relatively small. Um, but we had. Uh, but yeah, they're like you obviously you know as well as you iterating with product, you're iterating with the operational processes, particularly with something as complex as what we we're doing. Right. Think about all the different segments we were focused on. Right. Um, from dining, travel, experiences, luxury goods, and within those dozens or hundreds of sub segments, and within all those sub segments, you have hundreds of suppliers and partners. Right. It's operationally incredibly complex business. So the early years of building that were, you know, incredibly intense and were 24 seven, uh, level of commitment, um, which in some ways it's certainly taken out of me, right? There's only so long you can do that for. Um, but, um, but yeah, I felt like the company at that point from an operational process perspective, from a team perspective was in a very stable place. And we were in a place where we could continue growing a lot of revenue and the operations team without it directly being managed by one of the founders. Um, so, uh, so that was, you know, and, and I guess the motivation behind me doing it, you know, was I a little bit tired? Maybe. Um, I felt like I was very healthy at that point in time. It was more, uh, I love building things and I love the, you know, as I said, that feeling of, of creating something from nothing and you get a first customer to still remember the first customer that paid for Velocity Black. And I still remember watching them use the product. Um, and I, I love that part of the journey um, the most. And there are ways you can like thread that into later parts of the journey. You know, you can still do a lot of that innovating and launch new products later on. But um, but a lot of that had, had gone by, by that point, right? And uh, just being just being frank. So, um, and I'd been doing a lot of investing in early stage companies myself. I stumbled across an idea that a couple of friends were working on and felt that um, it was the culmination of all my experience as both, an, uh, as, as both a founder and operator and as an investor and felt like uh, it was too good an opportunity to, to not to start. Um, so, um, so yeah, that, those are the reasons. I, uh, what was the reaction of the investors that, that were investing in the company, the Series A, B, and so forth, when you announced the, your intention to step down as as uh, as kind of a managing director or CEO or whatever your title was at the time? 
Um, they, were, they were relieved. They were like, thank God we finally got rid of them. Um, <laughs> no, no, they, uh, look, I, I, most of them, look, they, they, I mean, I was also, by the way, still at that point in time, the largest shareholder in the company, right? So I, I had more incentive than anyone for the company to continue operating smoothly. And if I felt that in any way my departure would have hampered that or my stepping back to non-exec chairman would have hampered that, I would not have done it. Um, so I, I feel like a lot of them, a lot of them know me very well, um, and trusted me. Uh, therefore, you know, I had, I had a few, you know, we had quite a large cap table in terms of number of individuals and a few people reach out sort of with some concerns or worries. But once they spoke to me, they realized there wasn't like something else happening, right? Frequently in these situations, something else is happening, right? Someone's done something wrong or someone's really getting fired or whatever it may be. But that, you know, that wasn't the case here. And I feel that once they spoke to me on the phone, they realized, you know, and I explained the situation the company was in and how strong it was. And, you know, and they knew I had more of an incentive than any of them to make sure it succeeded. Um, they realized, uh, you know, it wasn't, uh, it's not the end of the world. So. How did you retain so much equity? When I talk to people who have gone through three and four rounds of financing, they're down to single mm-hmm. digits. Yeah, we, we were still double digits. Um, but we, you know, it was, um, I guess that the answer is that we raised at high valuations, right? um, to be brutally honest. Um, but, um, and yeah, like well, I would say, you know, me and Zia were still the largest shareholders at the point of the exit, right? Um, but, um, but yeah, I, yeah, really it came down to the, f- the fundraising dynamics. We were raising, I think, at a, a good point in time, to be honest. Um, we both had quite credible backgrounds in what we'd done previously. And, you know, we had such a large network of potential investors, both us directly and then some of our other investors that came in early. That, And I, I would say it's definitely one of our strengths, fundraising. Both me and Zia and Zia is uh, absolutely world-class at it. Um, that uh, really we would kind of set the valuation and we'd speak to enough investors until we filled the round. And how did that play and, and so, in, in exit? Because of course, the flip side of getting a high valuation is in order to get a return for those investors, you got to yeah. get an astronomical sale price. So did, did how did that sort of impact your thinking when it came to exit, that you'd raised money at these sort of lofty valuations? Mm-hmm. When I say lofty, I mean, I mean lofty relevant, probably uh, relative to the level of results we had in terms of revenue. Um, I don't, you know, we never raised it you know, billions of dollars in in valuation, Uh, you know, the exit, uh, whilst I can't personally comment on the price, um, uh, the exit price was a significant multiple of the last valuation that we raised at. Um, So all investors were getting a good return um, on what they'd invested. Um, But yeah, look, if that hadn't been the case, I think they, you know, my suspicion is, the capital one well they they certainly knew the last valuation that we raised that right so my suspicion is that their offer was almost based on that right they're thinking okay you know there's a certain level of revenue here that we can maybe justify with this valuation and this is a good return for the latest investors and be hard for both the founders and their latest investors to turn down right so sometimes that that's that kind of yeah go ahead sorry alex sometimes when i talk to people who've done uh, multiple rounds. There's differing views on the on the on the cap table around exit. So that and what's a common theme is that the later stage investors are like, "Don't sell. We can take this thing to the moon. Mm-hmm. Uh, we didn't invest for you to turn around and sell it six months later or whatever." And then the early stage folks, uh, friends and family in particular, and and certainly you know the early folks are like, "Are you kidding me? They're offering you X. Are you like, where do we sign?" Did you Seb, any like struggles hurting the cats associated with the investors and placating everybody with uh, the deal? No. Everybody Everyone was, happy. was very happy. Good stuff. There may have been one person, like the most recent people, We, I think we'd taken a little bit of capital at some point in the past couple of years. And there were a couple of people who were like, oh, you know, you sure we don't want to go to, you know, the, the billions of dollars here, you know, there's a couple of questions like that, but I, I didn't have anyone 
reach out like saying you know don't sign this like the terms are terrible or the valuation's not correct. what about you and Zia? did you guys align on 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 the oh sure like i mean we were the ones who were most questioning of whether we should do it right out of anyone like i think you know once some of our investors knew what the offer was they thought we were insane to even think about it because we were thinking about it take me inside that that conversation over applied with zia what like Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you must have had the like. Was there was there a discussion around? Is now the oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And so, what, what yeah, was yeah. that discussion like? So we, you know, we sat there. Like, I still remember when we got the first offer. Um, I was very excited. I still have it. I have a whiteboard at home in my own home office, and I wrote the number down on my whiteboard because uh, my wife was on a call and I went and showed it to her. So I was I was very excited even when we got the first offer and I thought it was a great offer. But equally, um, I did believe that we had what it take to continue growing the company. I believe we had a unique product. I believed in Zia and his ability to take the company to the next level. Um, and, you know, ultimately, I, I didn't want to, you know, impact his thoughts on it too much whilst I was, again, the larger shareholder, at the end of the day, I'd step back to be non exec chairman. So I, I very frankly said to him, a lot of this is up to you because I'm not full time in the business. It comes down to your energy and your appetite. And ultimately, if you don't want to accept this and want to carry on down the road, I'll support you on that. Um, so, you know, I left it effectively to him to make the decision. And yeah, he, he did think about it. But, um, you know, certainly once we had the second offer, um, he, yeah, he was he was fully on board with it. Are you able to share how much more the second offer was on a percentage basis? I think the first offer there was like a range, um, and then the second offer came in like probably ten percent above um, the top end of the range, basically. Yeah, and there was some other sort of incentives and things in there which which made it. Um, which, yeah, which, you know, good stuff for the team. And, 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 you know, they thought more about how do we motivate the team, keep them incentivized, post the acquisition, things like that, um, which uh, which made us, yeah, I think it was uh, overall a very, very good offer. So. Sounds amazing. Um, I, I'd be uh, remiss in, in letting you go before I ask you a couple of lightning round questions. They just require a, a, sure. a phrase or a sentence or two. Um, what's the slimiest trick a potential investor or acquirer tried to play on you? Uh, I have no bad words to say about Capital really? One. They were an exemplary acquirer throughout the process. Um, and I'm not just saying that. That's <laughs> great. They genuinely were. They were fantastic. Um, you know, uh, so I have nothing bad to say about them. Uh, the worst thing that investor ever did to us, I had a fully signed executed subscription agreement for 18 million pounds from an investor once, which legally they were obliged to complete on under UK law and they disappeared, never responded to an email or a phone call. Um, and it was fine because we had some other people interested in investing, but uh, certainly never forget that. Um, wow. And what, what else? Uh, yeah, that's it. That's, 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 that's big. The, I don't think you need to follow sticks up on in my that. mind. Yeah. <laughs> what was the biggest mistake you made in the process of selling your company? I think if if I was to think back and think about anything we could have done better, um, I would have appointed a bank earlier, probably. Because we, we did appoint a bank to help with the process, right? And I probably would have taken the Capital One sort of signs of interest and said, right, they're going to put an offer in. Let's appoint a bank right now, start the process. And then at least a few more people have enough time to get up to speed to maybe put some other offers in. And then you have a really competitive process, right? That's probably the only other thing I would have changed. But um, again, I don't think we lost out on that in dollar terms because they, you know, they up their offers significantly. I've heard, I've heard selling is, for a lot of entrepreneurs, we interview a roller coaster emotionally. What was the lowest mm-hmm. ebb you reached during the process of selling your company? In the actual sale part? Mm-hmm. They had more lawyers working on the deal than we had employees. And uh, at a certain point, you know, and rightfully so, they're a financially regulated institution and there are a lot of boxes that need to be ticked from a a regulatory and compliance perspective. Um, 
And I did, there were certain points where I could tell, well, firstly, Zia and the whole team that were working on it were just exhausted, right, by the number of requests and stuff that were coming in. Um, and uh, and I was I was not working at all on my new business. I was full time helping with with the process, obviously. Um, and uh, yeah, there was a time when we were very sapped of energy. Let me put it that way. Um, so um, so yeah. And at those points in time, obviously, when you have the most terse conversations or disagreements with people, um, um, but you know, we got through it, and we you know, I think with the help of our board and uh, and various other advisors, we managed to you know get all the responses in and, and make sure we, we stayed on track. What about highest emotional point? I would still say the moment we got the, the offer was still, still the, uh, that was when I realized we'd, we'd really built something very valuable. This is where you wrote the number down on the whiteboard. Correct. Yeah. Mm. I was very excited. Um, as, yeah. as you prepared for your exit, what did you consume in the way of content that helped educate yourself about the process of exiting? You had been successful in a previous career, but as I understand it, this was your first big, big exit. Did you, were there books, were there people you relied on, an EO forum? Like who, who did you kind of go to for, for advice? Um, so um, my previous career was uh, doing distress turnaround, distress m and So I, I had a lot of trans, I probably done a couple of dozen sort of M&A transactions as part of that um, career. So I had a good understanding of how an M&A process works. I, uh, but those were distressed deals which were very different from when you're selling your company for a lot of money. Yeah. Right? Um, so, uh, so yeah, look, I did seek counsel. I, you know, our board were great. Um, uh, Jamie Caring, uh, who, who's got a lot of experience from, from a brand perspective, but helped uh, certainly throughout the process. And Carve Atrak, he actually used to work for, for American Express. Um, and th- they were both very helpful at various points in, in keeping us on track. Um, I spoke to some, a couple of friends who, who I've, I know a lot of exited founders. And so I spoke to a few of those exited founders for their real insights on, on the process, right? I mean, there's, I'm, I'm being very open with you now, John, but there are obviously some things I can't say publicly. And, uh, certainly, you know, uh, reaching out to someone who's been through that process before would be very helpful for you. Um, because there's, yeah, there's, there's unsaid things which, um, which they might tell you on a one-to-one basis, which will certainly help you get through the the process um, successfully um, and with your sanity intact. Well, I'm not sure about that. But what did you buy yourself to celebrate? I still haven't bought myself anything, you know. Well, I haven't bought myself an actual thing. I went. I, we had a sort of, we had some drinks with some friends, and then I, I took some friends away for like a weekend. Um, Where'd you go? Was, we we went. It was actually just near London. Um, we went to a, a place called Cowarth Park, very nice hotel, and rented one of the sort of villas there. Um, and we had a great time. We, we, we hired a, a nice car and, and lots of uh, we had lots of activities. Uh, I haven't actually bought myself a physical gift. I I will, um, but I I want to be careful. I think a lot of the it, it is hard to adjust. Um, uh, you know, even though I was successful before, this is just a completely different level, and it is quite hard to adjust. And I feel like in the first six months, some of those big purchase decisions are probably the ones that you'll regret. So I'm I'm kind of taking it slowly on that front. I do love watches. And there's one watch that I've wanted my whole life, um, which is a classic Daytona, Paul Newman Daytona, um, which I'm thinking about. But uh, but yeah, uh, it'll be a while before I actually follow through on that. but yeah, that, that would be the thing I'd give myself. There you go. There you go. But you start off with an experience, which seems ex- appropriate given the experience nature For sure. of, of, yeah. of the role. Um, I'd be remiss again in not asking you quickly about your new company sequel. This sounds really cool. Describe it for our listeners. Um, so sequel is a community of the world's best athletes investing in the world's best startups. Um, it's, a, it's an app. It's an investment platform. Our clients are exclusively professional and ex-professional athletes, everyone from Super Bowl winners to Champions League winners, Olympic champions, um, you know, uh, world-renowned golfers, tennis players, um, a really amazing lineup of, of individuals. And we help them learn about investing. Uh, and then, so we have a lot of educational content on startups and investing and entrepreneurship through the platform. And then we help them invest in uh, the best uh, startup opportunities out there. So 
we partner with leading VC funds, ones with historically um, great returns, and we invest directly alongside them in, in some of the most exciting companies, all companies which are changing the world for better. So broadly in impact categories like climate tech, education, healthcare, um, uh, so things which will hopefully not just provide a financial return to athletes, but provide a, a return for society and for the world. Um, and yeah, we're just getting started with that. We launched uh, a couple of weeks ago. We, we've already done our first deal. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's very exciting to be uh, to be building again. That's so cool. So two-sided market, professional athletes, and some of the world's best startups. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure how many professional athletes we have listening to this show, but I know we have a lot of startups. Uh, and so <laughs> where can they go to learn more about SQL? So you can either reach out to me directly on Twitter or LinkedIn, or you can go to joinsql.co, um, and there's a founders page there with a lot more in- information about how we work. You can also you know, apply to our investment engine where we'll try, if, even if you're not right for us, we'll try to make some relevant introductions to, to other investors. Um, and uh, yeah, um, but also feel free to reach out directly to me on LinkedIn or Twitter. And we'll put Alex's pages for both Twitter and LinkedIn in the show notes at builtthecell.com. Alex, thanks for doing this. Awesome. Thank you, John. 